I would bet that we eventually hear the story about how Redfall came to be. I, I would bet that uh, eventually one day there will be a report that will talk all about whether this came from before the Microsoft acquisition or after, how long it's been development, the troubled cycle of development, et cetera, et cetera. And when all of that stuff comes to light, I would bet anything that the cause of the problem will not be the hundreds of people who just tried their best to get this game over the line because their boss's boss's boss demanded that it launch in the state that it's in at the time that it launched. And that is exactly what happened. I woke up this morning and saw that Jason Trier over at Bloomberg released a new report called Inside the Making of Redfall, Xbox's Latest Misfire. Uh, where he tweeted, Redfall from Xbox's well-respected Arcane Studios is one of the year's worst-reviewed games. What happened? It's a story of unclear direction, a severely understaffed team, and a game that many devs didn't actually want to make. There's a lot of stuff going on in this piece, and you should read it. It's down in the show notes, but I'll try and break it down into some bite-sized chunks uh, if you're listening or watching. I'll also have chapter markers so you can skip around if you want to. But I think the first thing that I, I found the most interesting is where Redfall came from. Because one of the things about Redfall that's so interesting, if you haven't played it, is that it is by Arcane Studios, a studio known for making really in-depth single-player immersive sims like Dishonored and Prey, who specifically broke out of their own mold to make a four-player co-op multiplayer game. As a concept, I think that took a lot of Arcane fans by surprise. I, not really being a huge Arcane fan, if I'm being totally honest, uh, I respect their games more than I enjoy playing them, is how I'll put it. I found that to be kind of exciting. And one of the things about the uh, inception of Redfall is that in 2018, ZeniMax, the, the company that owned Arcane, was looking to sell itself and apparently was like lightly nudging all of its studios to start to create some games that involved what I'll call live service adjacent games. Uh, games that have microtransactions, multiplayer elements, live just live service elements in general. And we saw that with id Software and with Bethesda, both studios primarily known for making single player experiences, starting to dip their toes into live service and multiplayer stuff. So when it came time for Arcane to create a new game, hot off the heels of Prey, which came out and was a critical success, but kind of a commercial disappointment, I think the studio started to ask itself, or at least based on Jason's reporting, the studio started to ask itself, how do we make something a little bit more broadly appealing while also appeasing our corporate shareholder masters? And I think this is an important point. This is Arcane Studios, known for making primarily one kind of game, wanting to branch out and wanting to make something that's more interesting to them, wanting to kind of stretch their muscles and see if they can kind of move themselves into a new avenue. And that's really important to keep in mind because I find that with conversations about stories like this, everyone wants to point their finger at one specific group or person or team. And the answer is always going to be muddier than that. Like, it's really easy to point at ZeniMax and be like, well, ZeniMax is obviously the problem here because they're pushing people into making live service games. But then you say, well, Arcane actually wanted to make live service game. They wanted to make something that was multiplayer. But then people will say, oh, it's Arcane's fault, but we'll get to why. It's not Arcane's fault. It's, you know, management's fault, unfortunately, because Arcane is an entity filled with a lot of people, around 100 people, as it turns out. And not all of those 100 people wanted to make Redfall. So the idea comes about Red Redfall is pitched to ZeniMax as a game that is a multiplayer spin on their immersive sim single player shooter that also just happens to have an in-game store filled with cosmetics that you can buy. And I have played Redfall enough to know exactly where that would slot in because uh, you frequently find stakes that you can attach to your guns that have a bunch of like Call of Duty ass leopard print and stuff on them. Or they look like a mammoth tusk or something. Like, you can get a bunch of different stakes you can add to your weapons. I imagine you could also get different skins for your weapons. And there are also multiple costumes that each of the four characters can wear, which I imagine also were things that you would have been able to buy via a season pass or in a store or something like that. So let me just take a step back here. I'll, I'll even do it literally uh, real quick to say two things. Number one, I think Redfall is all right. I have talked about it on this show a whole bunch. I played it right when it came out. I downloaded it on Game Pass, uh, played it single player, played it with friends, uh, and in both cases, had like a pretty all right time. I would say it is not the best game in the world, obviously, uh, but it's also not the worst. I, I think it's one of those situations where a game being like disappointing and not great uh, 
tends to push people into the realm of hyperbole and saying this is the worst thing that Xbox has ever made. Xbox is fucked. Uh, their whole Xbox Game Studios is going to uh, drown because this one game was bad. And that's not the case at all. The thing about Xbox in this generation is that they are not just trying to beat Sony at their own game and make these big AAA PlayStation Studios-esque experiences, they're trying to get people to sign up for Game Pass because Xbox is no longer just a box that you put under your TV, but it's like an idea almost, as weird as that might sound. It's why they're letting you play Game Pass games on PC. It's why they have xCloud as a thing that they're continuing to push more and more, and they're getting to the point soon, and they've announced this. It just hasn't dropped yet, and I'm really excited for when it does. But they're getting to the point where not only will you be able to play all your Game Pass games via xCloud, but you'll be able to play any game on the Xbox marketplace via xCloud. Because Xbox is owned by Microsoft, and Microsoft's whole thing right now is cloud services. It's the thing they care about the most. Microsoft wants to move into a future where everybody is using Microsoft products at all times, and it's actually pretty clean of them to pivot their gaming division into that vision of Microsoft as well. That was a long, rambly way of saying, I think Redfall's all right. I didn't, I didn't hate it. <laughs> I didn't play a whole lot of it, but I, I didn't hate it. I think you can just feel the rough edges. I think you can feel why people are disappointed. But I saw a lot of hyperbole about it being you know, the worst game of the year. And that's like obviously not the case. It just isn't what people expected. As with everything, it always comes down to expectation management. So that's point one. Point two is I think a lot of people pointing at Redfall and saying, why did Arcane do this in the first place? Like, why would Arcane make a multiplayer game? And truthfully, I don't, I don't agree with that line of thinking at all. I think that uh, Arcane is well within their rights to say, hey, we should branch out, especially when you consider that like Dishonored 1 did pretty well critically and commercially. Dishonored 2 did pretty well critically, but not commercially. Then Prey 3 didn't do well commercially either. Raises a lot of questions about, you know, what's next for them, what they should be doing. I think it's actually a natural line of thought for the management team over at Arcane to think to themselves, we need to make something a little bit more broadly appealing. I think that actually makes a lot of sense. I firmly believe that an artist, or in this case, a group of artists, is always well within their rights to try and broaden their horizons. There's a famous David Bowie quote that I don't know off the top of my head, uh, so I'm going to butcher it, but it's something to the effect of, if you're comfortable, then you're not getting better. All artists should endeavor to make themselves uncomfortable. Pushing yourself is the best avenue for growth. And I feel like that's, you know, even if it didn't turn out great, that's the intention behind Redfall. That's the intention behind taking this studio known for making one specific kind of thing and moving it into making a second kind of thing. So when there are people asking why would Arcane make a multiplayer game, the answer is that it's just growth, artistic growth. It, it makes everyone in the studio hypothetically better. There's a reasoning I can see where you have this studio filled with AAA talent, people who are known and love making single player stuff, who want to stretch those muscles and say, what if we tried to make a multiplayer game? That's an exciting idea, really, when you think about it. That's an exciting idea to have the studio that then becomes a double threat, right? You have a team of talent that can do both now. That's really cool, in theory. And that leads into what Jason gets into in terms of what actually happened behind the scenes. Because unfortunately... Although that's an exciting idea, and management was really excited about it, the team absolutely was not excited about it. There's a quote here that says, the fundamental tension between single player and multiplayer design remain unresolved. The team just didn't have this clear path forward that they really needed. And Jason mentions that the management team was also pulling so many references and so many inspiration points from things like Borderlands and Fallout that like, you just didn't really get a cohesive vision for what the game was supposed to be. At the very top, you need a really cohesive vision to relay to your team so they know what they're making. And that just didn't happen here, which is really unfortunate. And this is the wild stat that's getting passed around this morning, but 70% or more of Arcane's employees left during development of Redfall. There's a lot to say about that. But you have to assume that a lot of those people wanted to work at Arcane in the first place because they wanted to make single player first person immersive sims because that's what the studio is known for. As Jason outlines in the report, what that also means is that as people start funneling out of the studio, it becomes really hard to replace those people because they also weren't able to talk openly about what they were building. So a lot of the people who were applying to Arcane were expecting to make a very Arcane game and not something like Redfall. I think the biggest question that's on my mind at this point about this stat in particular is when you've lost 70% of your studio, is it still the same studio? I know there's the ship of Theseus. You can talk about the ship of Theseus day and night. You know, you replace all the boards on the ship. Is it still the same ship? At the end of the day, those are wooden planks and these are people. These are human people who imbued 
the company with their sense of culture and with their expertise. And when that starts funneling out and a bunch of new talent starts funneling in, generally what that means is the studio culture shifts dramatically. 70% is a lot of people. Even if, you know, Jason says there's about 100 people that worked at Arcane at this time. That means at least around 70 people probably left Arcane <laughs> over the course of the past couple of years. Which means a pretty fundamental shift in what Arcane is and what it will probably become. It raises a lot of questions, even if the next game they make is like Dishonored 3 or just another first person immersive sim. If they try to go like back to the well and try to do the thing that they did before and succeed the next time, it raises questions about their ability to do that. Because the Arcane we have now is not the Arcane that we had then. So then all of this leads back up to Xbox and Microsoft and raises a lot of questions about their investment in ZeniMax and the way that they manage the studios under the Xbox Game Studios brand in general. Phil Spencer, who's the head of Xbox, went on Kind of Funny Games recently, uh, just about Redfall and the launch of Redfall and the future of Xbox, and specifically on Redfall said that uh, reviews were, quote, significantly lower than our internal metrics. Jason reports in his story that the people at Arcane knew for a fact that this game was going to come out and not perform well because release dates had been shifted over and over and over again. The live service stuff got stripped out. The multiplayer wasn't working really and i mean you can play the game right now you can download it on your xbox right now and you can play it and you can see exactly what the people who were working on the game at arcane could see and it raises a lot of questions then where microsoft got these internal metrics about why the game was going to perform well i would say some good follow-up viewing would be the psychonauts documentary that was recently released by double fine productions that you can go watch on their youtube channel which is really long it's uh like 50 hours or something but it's about the making of Psychonauts 2. And throughout the course of that development, you can learn a lot about how games are made, which is fascinating, company culture, what happens when a person who's important to the company leaves, things like that. All that's really interesting. But the thing that is most pertinent to this story specifically is when Microsoft acquires Double Fine and adds them to Xbox Game Studios. What's exciting to Double Fine and Tim Schafer is the lack of oversight, really. Microsoft is not coming in demanding that Psychonauts 2 become anything different. They're not really changing a whole lot. They're letting Double Fine just continue on as Double Fine. And Tim Schafer and team start to ruminate on the idea that like that's really exciting for them. That means they can pitch whatever games they want. That means that Double Fine can continue along its track of being Double Fine, really. Not Microsoft's Double Fine. And while that's cool for Double Fine, and while that worked out for Psychonauts 2, it does raise questions about how Microsoft is managing its other studios. It's raising questions, at least now, about how it managed Arcane. Because if you're purchasing a company like ZeniMax for almost $8 billion, you'd expect to want to have some oversight over the stuff that they're working on. You'd expect to be able to walk down into Arcane Studios, look at the state of the game, and say, hey, I don't think this is quite there yet. Maybe we should delay this even further. It becomes a little troubling for Xbox when you consider that a lot of the criticism that they're getting right now is that there's not enough first-party stuff releasing on Game Pass and releasing via Xbox Game Studios. And you put that in comparison with the PlayStation event that happened last week in which we saw a lot of the very recently acquired first-party studios now under the PlayStation Game Studios brand announcing games that are coming out hypothetically this or next year. It makes you wonder what's going on in Xbox Game Studios. It makes you wonder where all of these studios that they've acquired over the past five or six years are at and what they're working on. I'm sure it puts them in a tough position, right? Because if they're not releasing enough stuff and Redfall is like good enough and can be fixed in post hypothetically, then I guess there's business sense to be made in which you release the game, even though it's not ready. And everyone knows it's not ready. It kind of reframes a lot of how I've been thinking about Redfall to know that Microsoft thought it was going to be good, at least based on that kind of funny games interview. Where now I'm starting to ask myself, did they think it was going to be good or did they think it was going to be good enough? Did they bring in mock reviewers to review the game not to see how it was going to perform, period, but how it was going to perform in the state it was in at the time that it was reviewed? I don't know what the future is there. I just know that it puts a lot of pressure on Starfield to be good. And I've said it on the show before, but I just feel like our expectations for what Bethesda open world games are have shifted so dramatically over the past couple of years that I think when Starfield comes out and has the like Bethesda quirks and all of its little bugs that everybody used to think were really funny, 
those are not going to be received well anymore because people need this game to be like AAA, hugely critically and commercially successful thing. And I just worry there's like not a world in which that is even possible. I think there's so much pressure on Starfield that there's no way it can match that. And I'd love to be wrong. I mean, we just saw that with Tears of the Kingdom, right? It's that, That's a game that's a sequel to what a lot of people consider to be the best game of all time in Breath of the Wild. And I think most people thought there's no way it's going to be better than Breath of the Wild, but it'll at least be as good. And personally, I think I could argue that it's better than Breath of the Wild in a lot of ways. And maybe that's true of Starfield. Maybe Starfield comes out and uh, rules. Maybe it's awesome. That would be sick. I would love that. But it's just wild that Redfall came out and has had such an outsized influence on the conversation around Microsoft that we're now talking about Starfield. Redfall was such a disappointment and was managed so poorly that we're now asking questions about a different game by a different studio. All of that leads me to my last thought, which is just the tenor of conversation around live service games, which is the thing I've talked about a lot, but I, I just want to reiterate. I don't think that uh, having the, the phrase live service in your description of what the game is means what it used to mean. I think when people used to hear live service, they would immediately think this game is going to be terrible. It's going to be riddled with horrible microtransactions. Uh, and it's it's going to be a game that I hate. And I hate that this, that the industry is getting pushed in this direction, et cetera, et cetera. I just think that the world has changed. And I think that game development has changed dramatically. It's why PlayStation is creating at least 10 live service games simultaneously. Uh, it's why games like Fortnite are the biggest game in the world. Uh, I, it makes a lot of sense to me that studios would want to create a game that will continue to bring in revenue because the cost of developing games has ballooned so wildly that just releasing a game at 60 or even $70 isn't commercially viable anymore. There needs to be something else involved. And I think if that's the you know monkey's paw curls version of I just want like people to keep their employment and like get paid normal and good wages that are living wages then yeah i mean that's a pill that i'll swallow and on top of that i think there's also a world in which you could look at it through the lens of if a game is free to play and live service that means it's more accessible to a, a larger number of people gaming is an expensive hobby and it has been for its entire existence because you need to buy a box and you need to buy the game both of which are expensive. And the idea of more games going free to play, I think is a net positive. I think the thing that needs to get worked out and the thing, you know, if, if you have ire about the idea of live service, it should get directed towards predatory microtransactions specifically because there are games that do it well and there are games that don't. And we know what they are. And more and more governments are starting to know what they are as well. And they're stepping in when games step over the line of what is not acceptable. We're in kind of like a shaky rough patch right now where live service is starting to figure itself out. I just don't think most companies have fully come to terms with how to make and monetize live service games in a way that makes sense yet. And while it's exciting for studios like ZeniMax in 2018 who really want to sell themselves to Microsoft to say, hey, we're going to make a bunch of live service games because they print money. I don't think in 2018 ZeniMax uh, management fully understood the scope of what it was asking. The ongoing costs and the ongoing development that live service takes to succeed is not a thing that I, if I was to guess, a lot of like corporate C-suite executives were really keeping in mind while they were greenlighting these games. But I think now there are enough case studies, there are enough games out there to prove what works and what doesn't. And slowly, as best practices start to get put into place, the idea of live service, I think, will go away from the realm of I just hate it because it's live service. I think Jeff Grubb said this on a, a Games Mess Mornings episode recently, but uh, when he was talking about the PlayStation live service games, the 10 live service games that they're making, his take was like, as long as one of those is the level of Apex Legends, they've succeeded. It doesn't need to be Fortnite. It doesn't need to be up here. It just needs to be Apex Legends. And that's a success. And I think that's true. That's what a lot of these studios are trying to do. They just want to make Apex Legends. Anyway, shout out to Jason Trier for the report. It was really good. It's on Bloomberg. You should go read it. I would recommend it. Uh, thank you so much for watching this. My name is Brendan Bigley. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do that. If you're listening to this and you haven't reviewed it, please do that. Uh, I'll catch you later, man. Bye-bye. <laughs>